At the end of 2014, I flew to South Africa to begin a three-month tour, which started with five weeks driving around a wonderful country with a lot to offer. In particular, we enjoyed some of the unique opportunities available to interact with a great variety of weird and wonderful animals which inhabit this part of the globe. We visited some beautiful places, including some mysterious ruins that cover the area northeast of Johannesburg. Then just before Christmas 2014, we crossed the border into a country I knew very little about. So here we go, cornflakes in Botswana. We are halfway through our road trip in Southern Africa. A couple of days ago, we hired a car in Johannesburg and we've driven something like 800 or maybe 900 kilometers across the border into Botswana and through the Kalahari Desert which actually doesn't really look like a desert at all. It's very green. The journey was very interesting. It took us a lot longer than we thought it would do, mainly because Botswana has some of the, the most dangerous roads in the world, statistically speaking. There's so many animals. They don't have fences, basically, so they don't disrupt the migration routes so all the zebras and all the, the animals can move around. And that means that a lot of them are on the road and they've got something like four million donkeys and we've come across cows all over the roads and we even came across some ostriches and vultures and so it's very treacherous because we were you know almost hitting some of these things particularly at night time we happened to go like 50 kilometers an hour or something we've arrived in what is one of the most spectacular locations it's the Okavenga delta which is a, a hub of wildlife you can see all sorts of animals here Tomorrow we're going on a, on a canoe trip. We basically go a day into the delta and camp and then come back again. So we're hoping we're going to see all sorts of uh, interesting things. The next morning we picked up a fast boat and sped through the wetlands, passing locals going about their day and all sorts of bird life. After an hour we arrived in a mini port and met our guide before loading up the Makoro, a kind of wooden canoe which we jumped in to set off into the delta. So here we are floating on a bit of wood in the middle of Botswana very very peaceful moment for us actually our guide has been telling us all about the the interesting facts about this delta it is 18,000 square kilometers so it's pretty huge the waters come in from Angola and fill up this area and then head out through through Namibia we're in the, the dry season at the minute so the waters are particularly low so we're having to use the main channel sometimes you can go through the tiny little channels there's tons of uh, lilies there's two types of lily. There's one that flowers and comes out during the day, and there's another one that the flowers come out at night. These reeds here clean the water, so the locals drink the water. We can drink it, but we should really boil it first because of all the bugs inside. Um, beautiful place, as I said, floating on a bit of wood in the middle of Botswana is a pretty cool thing to do on, on Christmas Eve. We arrived at our campsite around lunchtime and our guy went straight to sleep. So we quickly set up the tents and went for a play on the canoes and very quickly found out that it's a hell of a lot harder than it looks. When the sun went down, and more importantly it cooled down, our guide took us for a walk to see what kind of critters we could find. Although we didn't find all that much, a few zebras, a load of termite hills, and some holes that anteaters had dug out looking for ants. Then we went back to enjoy the sunset to see if we could see Santa flying through the sky. So it's Christmas morning and instead of a sack full of presents at the end of my bed I've got the Okavango Delta It's a pretty cool view to wake up to We had some lions roaring not too far from us this morning and all sorts of birds and monkeys and loads of stuff we sail back with planes flying overhead, carrying tourists that must have been treating themselves for Christmas. Then after lunch we left the delta and headed towards the northeast. Due to the lack of fences and free movement of the animals, there were a number of sanitation checkpoints putting chemicals on our feet to prevent the spread of disease. <laughs> Quite a surreal moment on Christmas Day. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, stop the car, pick your shoes on, have your feet sprayed. Okay! To end Jesus' birthday, we ended up camping at a beautiful spot next to the river, where we had a few beers watching the sunset. In the morning, we drove north to visit a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a beautiful national park close to the Namibian border, with five sacred hills rising up out of a hard-to-reach plateau. Gonna get stuck in the sand. Yeah. Roads for four-wheel drive or hire cars? 
The area has unique religious and spiritual significance to the local people, as well as a unique record of human settlement over the millennia. We asked the guide to take us to a specific site that we read about online. So we're going to walk down and show you what is supposed to be one of the most sacred sites on the planet. It's not easy to get into, as you can see. So it's called, it's called the Serpent Cave. And this rock here is basically why. This is supposed to be kind of a giant snake, basically, with this being the mouth, this would be the eye, and then this would be the nose. So you really have to use your imagination. I mean, it does look kind of like a snake, but well, I'll leave that for you to decide. But there are lots of mythological stories associated with this area. For example, there's some hoof marks in some of these rocks, and that is said to be uh, cattle that were lowered down by the gods, and they've kind of formed a, a footprint in the, in the rocks there. And Kredo Mukwa, a South African shaman, has also told all sorts of interesting stories about how sacred this site is and, and his encounters with some possible reptilian beings. So it's a fascinating place for us. We hope we don't bump into any of these beings because all I've got is my Leatherman, so we're not going to stand much of a chance, really. Now, this area is also famous for four and a half thousand rock paintings. Now, you can see behind me here, there's a red one, which is obvious, and it's a giraffe. Then behind him, you've got a white, what is supposed to be an elephant. Now, another really interesting thing for us is the sacred geometry patterns that are found in some of these caves. This is just a couple of them here, and there's, there's more in another part of these hills that we're gonna go and have a look at soon. So we've come from the Serpent Cave, which is on the other side of the female hill, to have a look at these rock paintings here. Now, the majority of the four and a half thousand that are on these hills are animals basically, rhinos and, and antelope and, and giraffe. But there are some like this one and like those other we saw in the, in the serpent cave that are geometric shapes basically. We're not sure exactly what to make of these. This one could be a mandala possibly, but they're very faint and it's hard to see. But we've been told by our guide that these were basically drawn by shaman who were in trance or in a trance. So it's possible that they're in touch with their higher self or that these have some greater significance. It's just interesting because you find, as well as tons of ants, <laughs> it's just interesting because there are sites all over the planet where there are circles and, and geometric shapes. Now looking at the bigger picture, people like David Talbot have, have drawn similarities between a lot of these funny rock paintings, like the Squatter Man is a big one for example, and that's uh, related to, to plasma physics and, and a particular pattern that's formed with plasma discharge. So it's possible that uh, these, these kind of patterns are signs of ancient technology or ancient knowledge. Worth checking out their work. Electric Universe, Thunderbolts, fascinating stuff. From the park, we slowly started heading east, stopping off in a pub to see what goes on on a Friday night. It was great mixing with the locals as we had spent a lot of our time in hotels and lodges due to the lack of shops or restaurants in Botswana. We didn't stay that long though as we had to find somewhere to park the car and in the end we got lucky and found a pretty cool place. This is Lake Ngami, not one of the most famous spots to visit in Botswana, but we've come here for a couple of different reasons. The first is to correct myself. When we were visiting the Okavango Delta, the guide told us that, that the waters there actually flow out through Namibia to reach the sea, which is actually a load of rubbish. The, the guide was completely wrong, and, and the, the Okavango River is one of the few wateries in the world where it doesn't actually even reach the sea. So the waters come down from the highlands in Angola, and get absorbed by the salt flats and, and the plant life and the animals. Now this here is an overflow to that. So this kind of fills up whenever there's you know, a lot of water in the Okavango Delta. And for that reason, it kind of disappears and reappears. For example, in 1849, Dr. David Livingstone came here and saw the area completely full of animals and, and bird life. But then the lake completely disappeared a couple of years after that. And then, and then it disappears again in 1982, only to reappear in 2000. So this whole water is just basically coming up and down, depending on the, the water flow from the Okavango Delta. 
there's a really pretty spot. As you can see now, it's, it's kind of swampish. So there's lots of bird life here. Flamencos are particularly famous, although we can't see any now. But this bird in the background here is really cool looking. It's like a, it's almost like a dinosaur, pterodactyl or something. But, um, a great spot, but we must continue. We drove across country, arriving in the east with enough time to find a lodge and arrange a tour in the morning of a bird sanctuary where I decided to have my magic moment. Okay, here we go, cornflakes in Botswana. I've got my pick and pay cornflakes. Very exciting box there. So we are in an area which is basically the largest salt flats in the world. There is um, a bit of dispute about that because the single largest flat is in Bolivia, the Salada Uuni. And this is a collection of three pans or more which make up in total the greatest area, something like 12,000 square kilometers. So not what I was expecting really, because you can't really see any salt. We're in the rainy season, so it's all flooded. Um, I'm sad to say that these are genetically modified cornflakes. So I'm only gonna have a little sample just to prove that I've had them in Botswana. Because there's so much salt in this area that the ants don't go very deep underground, so there's absolutely tons of freaking ants all over the ground but anyway i digest this is the sour salt pan it's basically famous for bird life we've just driven about an hour and a half through all this flooded area and seen tons of different birds including ostriches flamingos pelicans and loads of other little ones that we didn't really know what they were here we go This is country number 74. It's a very nice country indeed. Really lovely people. It's really um, sparse. There's not, not very uh, densely populated, which is a cool thing. It's comparable to Mauritania, Australia, Mongolia. So for that reason, I like it. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. From the flats we drove north and when we started getting close to the national park the animals started to get a lot more interesting and also a lot bigger than the car. On our way to Chobe National Park. A load of elephants just chilling out. <laughs> more over there. We're not even in the national park yet. Just driving along the road and bumped into some giraffes, as you do. Can you see him? We arrived in Kassan in time to enjoy the beautiful scenery as the sun was setting over the Chobe River. Then in the morning we set sail again. Right, so we're in Chobe National Park, or just entering Chobe National Park. This is the Chobe River which basically has Namibia on this side and Botswana on this side. Now we're quite excited about this because this is the largest and densest population of elephants in the world. There's something like 71,000 of them in this national park. So we're first doing a boat trip to see if we can see crocodiles and hippos and stuff. And then we're gonna do a safari this afternoon to try and see some of those elephants. So really cool place and a nice thing to do on a day like this. As we floated along the border, we started to see some of the wildlife we had been hoping for. We saw a number of crocodiles, more little deer-type things, and hippos hiding in the water. But then as the air temperature rose, the hippos started coming up onto the land, and we got lucky as the river became too tempting for the elephants in the extreme heat of the day. So I just really wanted to document this moment. I haven't come prepared. I've got no milk or bowl or anything with me, but we've got a couple of hundred elephants behind us. It's an amazing moment for myself. So over here, there's a herd of about 50 odd, and there's a herd of 30, 40, another herd over here of again 30 or 40, and there's just tons of them all up the river. So this is gonna be my favorite cornflake moment of all time, I think, and I'm gonna to have to just eat some dry. Awesome, man, awesome. <laughs> I could have watched them all day as they had water fights and played in the mud, but we had to head back as the boat trip only lasted for the morning. Luckily we had the jeep tour, so after a spot of lunch we set off into the park for a close-up look of the elephants from a different point of view. We 
must have seen about 500 elephants by the end of what turned out to be one of the most enjoyable days on our trip around southern Africa. Then from Chobia, it was just over an hour's drive to the Namibian border and we started to reflect on our experiences in Botswana, and I couldn't help but thinking I would need to return one day with a better vehicle to reach those hard to get places, and also be better prepared so I wouldn't have to spend all my time in hotels and lodges. We spent a couple of weeks in Namibia, which turned out to be one of my favourite countries, with some amazing things to visit and great variety. 